Thank you, Charlie. So um, Charlie talked about the first of the four great vows. Sentient, sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. Sometimes it's translated as we vow to liberate them all. And he said something very interesting. He said, it has to start here. Did you move on? <laughs> it has to start. I told you I do that a lot. <laughs> it has to start here. Everything has to start here. So that's before speech, before thinking. It's before, before meaning more fundamental, not meaning in time, but more fundamental than speech, more fundamental than thinking, more fundamental than our ideas, more fundamental than our desires. And desire includes dislike, like and dislike are both forms of desire. So more fundamental than anything like that. That's where everything needs to come from. More fundamental than the notion of meaning. So my teachers and Master Sung San used to say, great meaning is no meaning. This is very important. So when we have ideas, then we're putting things in a box and we can't really reach out. We can't see things as they are. We just have our ideas and our feelings coming between us and this universe. This morning, um, Agata Sobieka, who's a JD Pope, Judo Pope Sinem, she's a teacher in the European school, and she zoomed in for the interviews this morning. And um, some people, she asked a question. She said, um, in the, the poem, uh, the song of Dharma nature, which is an old thousand year old or so poem, um, it said that everything is one. And then she said, so you and I are one. But Zen Master Sun San used to say, not one, not two. And then she would ask people, are we one or are we two? So that's a very interesting question. If we think we are separate from other beings, then we don't see how things actually are. If we think we're the same as other beings, then we also don't see things as they actually are. So how is it? That's very important. Hi! Hi. Are there any questions? Jane. Um, I heard a, a real little, little video of Zen, Zen Master Song, Song Yang, mm -hmm. and somebody had asked her about fear, and she said something about, you know, you need to take that fear and put it in your center, mm -hmm. send it there, and then digest it. Mm -hmm. And I've heard other Zen Masters and Jito Pumsonims talk about digesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, digest everything. So I'm not sure I get what that means. What is the digesting? So when you digest something, you take it in your mouth and you chew it up, or sometimes you just swallow it, depending on what it is. And then it goes down a series of tubes and it gets attacked by various acids and various elements of your biome, you know, various critters. You have more critters inside you than anything else. 
and then part of it gets absorbed as nutrients and part of it turns into sludge and we poop it out. So that's digestion. Okay? Okay. Yeah. There's another saying about fear that um, Rebecca Ott, who's a Jeter person in our school, really likes, and that's um, when um, Deepa Ma, who is a great Vipassana teacher, and when um, she was flying somewhere with one or more of her nuns, and um, they, they, they ran into really bad weather, and the plane was, you know, bucking up and down. And, you know, it was really scary. That stuff is really scary when it happens. And, um, and one of the nuns started freaking out, and Deepa Ma reached over to her and said, the daughters of the Buddha are not afraid. So that's another way of looking at fear. Okay? There are many, many ways of looking at fear. It's okay. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes. Madam. Do I just speak into the mic? Wait, yes, yeah, speak into the mic okay. loudly. Um, what does it actually mean to save a being? What does it mean to save a being? Yeah. Yeah, because Christians like to run around and save people too. They mean something really different. So the um, the word that that we're translating by save actually means to take to, to the other shore, like get in a ferry and you row to, or how are the ferries locomoted, you know, to the other shore. So to help people to the other shore. And it's often translated as liberate, to liberate all beings, which I think is a is a better translation. But you know, it's like when Charlie was saying, I can't give you wisdom. So you can't liberate anybody. But you can encourage. That's what we're doing right now. We're all together, you know, whether we're online or whether we're in the room, we're all together right now, helping each other, liberating each other, being examples for each other, encouraging each other. So it's this whole sangha together that helps liberate all beings, not one person by themselves. So there's this idea, and this actually came up this morning in someone's interview, I forget who, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you, um, where you know the idea is how, and I had this question when I first started practicing, and you know, I would say sentient beings are numberless, we vow to save them all, you know, delusions are endless, etc. And you know, a few months into my practice, I remember saying to um, Diane Eagles, who was then Diane Houghton, and she wasn't a teacher, she was just a student who was more mature than I was. And she's a teacher now, and you know, she's a very tiny woman, you know, sm much smaller than I am. And, um, and I remember saying to her, how can I save all beings? And she sort of stood on tiptoe and patted me on the head and said, You'll get it, <laughs> you know? but you don't, on your own, do this. We do it together, and this is actually in the morning bell chant, the um, the part that begins uh, that starts J il ge wan something. That wan means bow, and what that three or four lines is about is bowing together with all beings, entering the great bow ocean. Together, Do Jung Seng, which means save all beings. Together, save all beings. In one moment, in one place, together attain enlightenment. Together wake up, together attain the Buddha way. So we're not separate, we're not these little marbles that are impenetrable, the things just bounce off. We're not responsible for the entire universe. Together, we are the entire universe, and together, we help the entire universe. So it's, we're acting together. So then you think of saving the many beings, and it makes perfect sense. 
you know, because you, Lenny, you don't have to do it all by yourself. Now there's the, the comic strip where the, the, I think it's crabs or maybe it's clams and some kind of sea creature is stranded on the beach and the little girl is throwing them back into the ocean and the little boy comes in and says, why are you doing that? You can't possibly save all of them. And she says, well, I can save this one. You know, so I help this one, and you help that one, and you help that one, and you know, together, everybody gets help. So that mind, which is not about what makes me happy, what makes me comfortable, but that mind that says, what is needed for me right now? How can I help this world? That mind, that direction is very important. And then you do your part, and other people do their part. And if everybody does this, what a wonderful world this would be. Okay? Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, Evelyn. I actually have two questions. Okay. Um, the first question is, um, what makes Zen better, I guess, than say other forms of Buddhism or even other philosophies or other religions. And then my second question is, if all beings are numberless, then how can we save all of them? Because okay. there's an infinite number of them. So, okay. Why is Zen better? I like it. <laughs> but there's this wonderful saying in Buddhism, in Buddhism 84,000 expedient means. And that means that no one way is better for everyone. Now, of course, when you practice a certain practice and you like that practice, it fits you well, then you think, this is the best practice. So secretly, I think not only Zen, but not only Korean Zen, but quantum school of Zen, I think that's the best practice because it's the one I like, you know, it's the one that fits me. But that's just, you know, little petty Judy. But in reality, all of these expedient means, it's really wonderful because it means that everybody can find something, something that fits them. So if you come to me and you have an interview with me or you ask a question of me, I will respond in the way that resonates with the teaching that I've learned, the teaching that resonates me, the teaching that I do. You go to another teacher in another school, they will respond very differently. Which resonates with you? That's what's important. And then you find that practice that resonates, and you that's the practice that you do. But it's not like, I'm not gonna sit here and say, you know, quantum school of Zen is superior to all other schools. I don't think that's stupid. How could it possibly be? So there's 84,000 expedient means. And the one that resonates with you, the one that fits you, the one that clothes. And some clothes are too big, some clothes are too small, some clothes are just right, like Goldilocks. You find the one that fits you, and that's what you devote yourself to. Okay? And your second question was related to the previous question, how can we save all beings? All beings, all beings, throughout time and space. How old are you? 23. Yeah, so 24 years ago, how could you save those beings? Right? So that's, that, that's, when you think of it that way, time and space and the physicality of our bodies limiting ourselves, like you're in Lawrence, Kansas, you're not on Maui, which Lord knows needs help right now. You know? So how do you save all beings when here you are, you know, in the Dharma room of the Kansas Zen Center in Lawrence, Kansas, and there's all the suffering throughout the world. And before you were born, there would be suffering. And after you die, if there are any beings left on this planet, there will be suffering. And if there are any beings anywhere in this universe, there will be suffering because that's the first noble truth. Existence means dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. So that's just how the universe is. So how can we liberate all beings working together? All beings working together to liberate all beings. So that's how it works. Okay? So thank you for your questions. See, there's time for one more question. 
Anybody online with a question? Well, I have a question and it's related to the question you just answered. The thing is, you know, you said we all work together and I won't name the people who aren't working with us, <laughs> but <laughs> they there are some... know that they're working with us. Well, the war in Ukraine. Yes, the war in Ukraine. I mean, you know, Maui is, is kind of a, you know, a natural disaster, mm -hmm. um, but well, not really because the electrical company had a lot to do with it, but yeah. Oh, well, I haven't read, I haven't read. Yeah. So, okay, maybe it, so we can include Maui as well. I mean, do I know whether, whether that, but it, that's not what it looks like. It doesn't look like we're all working together. Otherwise there wouldn't be any war. So everyone has opinions of how to help. So I think that Putin really believes that Ukraine is part of Russia and that he's helping these benighted Ukrainians by bringing them back to mother Russia. I think he really probably believes that. And I think a lot of Russians would have believed that even before Putin declared that there was a war. And the people in Ukraine believe that they're not part of Russia. And I tend to agree with them. Although my father and his family came from Ukraine, but they said they came from Russia because at the time Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire and they felt that they were part of Russia. If I'd said to him, you're from Ukraine, he would have said, what? You know? So these things are people's ideas. And so people think they're helping. There's, you know, the villains in the, in the Marvel movies that go, Wah! I am evil. There's no one like that, or very few people like that. But I think most people believe that what they're doing, you know, you're torturing somebody, you're doing that for a cause, you're doing that for a reason, you think you're a good guy. You know, right now, the, you know, with the Oppenheimer movie, and there's all this discussion of what were these guys doing? What were they thinking? What was going through their minds? Well, at the time, they were saving the world. They were saving the world from Nazi Germany getting a bomb. So everybody, or almost everybody, I guess there's some psychopaths that are so far gone that they don't do this, but almost everybody believes that they are helping. So how can your mind be clear enough that you see what it is you're actually doing and the effect that it is actually having? That's the question. And that's practice. That's why we practice. We practice so that we can name our bullshit, you know, name that bullshit, right? So we can see it and we can say, oh, look at that. And so that we can open our minds and hearts to possibilities that we would not have imagined on our own. So we can have this strong center, this open heart, this clear mind. And then you realize if you declare war in a country, there's going to be suffering. And a lot of people are going to die. And a lot of infrastructure will be restored. And precious things like family photos, you know, those will be gone. And you realize that. You realize the health crisis that brings about. You realize all of that. That makes it harder to declare war. But if you don't realize that, it becomes very easy. I'm right. This is what I want. I'm going to get it. However, you know? So that's why we practice. We practice so we don't make these mistakes that cause suffering when we think we're doing the right thing. Okay? That makes sense? Good. I guess it's time for one more question if there is one. Okay, thank you very much. Practice and interviews will start in five minutes.